you guys welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel now welcome back go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed unless you know your taste level is lacking and girl that's the fact i hope you guys have been doing great during this absence of mine i know many of you probably reached out on social media the thing is about me i don't really care for social media like that honestly i prefer not to even be on it at all i created my instagram account that i have now my twitter account all of that when my youtube channel gained traction just to promote it some and I really only post for y'all so when I take my little hiatus my little you know me time and I don't post please don't take that as a sign that something is wrong that's a sign that mama just ain't doing something that she just don't really like to do you know but I'm sure many of you reached out and were probably worried that something was wrong nothing was wrong nothing i just wanted to take a break i've been traveling i went home to memphis for a little bit we have a new addition in the family he's so cute i just love him so much he is so cute like i have to i was looking at my calendar just yesterday and i was just there two weeks ago and i was like i gotta get back and see him like i miss him and he's so cute and i just i just love him so much he smells so good he has that that newborn smell and it's just like literally the best thing i was sniffing him the whole time and shout out to y'all that's been catching me around this city girl and in the airport y'all the case that we are getting into today i've watched hours upon hours of interview footage trial footage and it was a lot going on now before we get into today's video i want to give a special huge thanks to care of for sponsoring today's video care of is a subscription service that ships high quality personalized vitamins to your door every month you take a short in-depth quiz about your health goals and get personalized recommendations based on your answers you also have the option of trying different products as your health goals change i actually just added carrot into my mix for you know a little healthy hair one of the things that i like most about care of is their packaging as i just previously stated i did some traveling recently and typically i would always get off track with my vitamins because i would have to portion out vitamins carry them in a case all of that care of's packaging makes it easy to just carry them with you on the go and stay on track i feel like that's one thing that really sets them apart from other brands at least for me it makes mother's life a whole lot easier now, i'm currently still taking the multivitamin plus iron to fill in the gaps because my eating habits aren't always the best okay so it can fill in any nutritional gaps that might form there i'm still taking the rhodiola for stress and mood which i feel like helps me out a lot collagen as well for skin skin health and another thing that i've really noticed is the strength of my nails like my nails were never this healthy girl i'm actually able to get dip powder now i used to always have to get a hard acrylic and a tip in order for them not to break off but they are lasting girl with just a little bit of dip powder another plus is that their daily vitamin packs are made from a plant-based fan i just love that it has my name on it and then each pack has like this little fact on it and today's fact it's just like fingerprints everyone has a unique tongue print did not know that every day you learn something with care of girl every day now the last time a lot of you all did let me know that you tried out the brand and that you were pleased so far with your purchases if you haven't yet i encourage you to take the care of quiz to find out what is recommended for you use my code Brittany v 50 for 50 percent off of your first order and the price point without a discount is already amazing already so check them out back to the scheduled programming so in today's video, we are getting into the chaotic case of Jeffrey Munt, Joseph Bennett, and Jamie Carroll, a very messy love triangle. There is a lot to unpack here, so without further ado, let's just get right into it. So on June 17, 2010, a 911 dispatcher receives a phone call from a frantic man. And this man is claiming that he is in fear of his life. He's hiding inside of his home. He tells the dispatcher that the perpetrator is actually his boyfriend, who he is deathly afraid of. His boyfriend is actually ramming the other side of the door. And although it is locked, he can hear the wood breaking. The dispatcher attempts to calm him down and advises him to remain on the line no matter what, and that she is sending out a unit. The caller is 38-year-old Jeffrey Munt, and he is also the owner of the home that they are inside of. Police arrive to the scene, they speak with Jeffrey, and they also speak with Joseph, the live-in boyfriend, who is also the alleged aggressor. He's also 38. Now, Joseph is claiming that Jeffrey is lying, but they decide to take Joseph into custody, and he is pissed off about it, okay? He is not a happy camper whatsoever. During the ride down to the police station, he drops an unforeseen bomb on them from the back seat. He alleges that while they have come out and arrested him for nothing, they should have arrested his boyfriend, Jeffrey, who has a body 
buried in the basement. Now at this point, police are like, damn, a domestic violence case, okay? Tell us more about this murder. And honey, out of spite, Joseph gets to singing like a little canary, okay? According to Joseph, one rainy winter night in 2009, his boyfriend Jeffrey was in the mood to have a little bit of fun. He wanted some, some drugs, child. He wanted to have a little three-way love affair. And so they call over a reputable dealer by the name of James Carroll. James, most commonly referred to as Jamie, he comes over to make a sale. But unbeknownst to him, Jeffrey has a more sinister plan in mind. He also intends on robbing Jamie for everything he has on him. Money, drugs, all of the things of value. He welcomes Jamie into the home, makes him get comfortable, puts a little adult content on the television, and before you know it, the three of them are partaking in all of the things, girl. It's just, it's a whole lot going on. A whole lot of group activity. Everyone appears to be enjoying themselves and having a good time, but then Joseph says, out of nowhere, he sees blood splatter, and he is just standing there paralyzed in fear. He was aware of the plan to rob Jamie, but he didn't know that Jeffrey had any intentions of hurting him. So at this point, he's like, okay, what if his plan is also to hurt me as well? Like what's going on here? Without hesitation, Jeffrey grabs a bed sheet. He wraps Jamie in the sheet and drags him down into the basement. He then comes back up the stairs where Joseph is still standing, looking very much shocked and confused and afraid and proceeds to make Joseph's place in his plan crystal clear. He is going to get himself downstairs in their basement to help dig a hole, bury the body, and clean up the crime scene, or he too will be going down in that hole. Now at this point, the less of two evils in Joseph's mind is to get down there and help. He is willing to grab a shovel child, a spoon, or anything, whatever is required, whatever works, in order to get this hole dug so that he is not also unalived. The officers who have him under arrest as why now like why are you saying something today is it just to avoid going down to jail yourself like what is the motivation for you telling us this right now and not coming forward before it's literally been six months since this incident occurred and he's lived inside the house with his body in the basement without saying anything. Joseph explains to them that he felt like it was safest to do it this way because now they could circle around and pick up Jeffrey while he is tucked away safely in police custody himself. He also tells them that he is definitely tired of living with the secret for all of these months. He's tired of living in fear and it's just time out for the foolishness. Some of the detectives are not completely sold on his story and so he tells them look i don't have a reason to lie the man gets a sheet of paper and a pencil and draws out an entire map of the home including the basement pinpointing exactly where they could find this body if they just go out there and take a look they send a unit out there to the house to speak with jeffrey and they're pretty much straight straight up and straightforward they let him know look your boyfriend is claiming that there's a body in the basement and Jeffrey responds in complete shock. He's like, there's a what? He then proceeds to tell them that his boyfriend is crazy, that they probably really can't trust what he's saying. I barely trust him. You guys should not. He also tells police that his boyfriend has threatened to end his life on multiple occasions. And not only that, he's made these threats to frame him for murder if he ever tried to leave him. So he figured that this is what his boyfriend is up to now. They obtain a search warrant for the home. And in the meantime, they take Jeffrey down to the station for questioning as well. So he is now joining his boyfriend down to the police station. And while he is being taken down to the police station for questioning, Another group of investigators proceed to search the home utilizing the map that Joseph hand, hand wrote for them as a guide. And right where his little map indicated that the body could be found, there is a mound of dirt, which definitely appears that it could have been a freshly prepared grave. It does not take much digging or much time before they unearth a giant tub there underneath the dirt and they actually lift the top of the tub just a little bit by accident with the shovel and as soon as they do this horrible stench just fills the basement that smell alone was more than 
enough reassurance that the story that Joseph had told them was true. At least the part about it being a body down there. Now they continue to search the rest of the home and they also find blood splatter and a bullet hole in one of the doors. When they go confront Jeffrey and let him know the news that there has in fact been a body found inside of his home, he responds very dramatically. He is visibly upset. He is distraught. He is surprised. He's like, oh my God, you mean to tell me I've been living above a body all of this time and I didn't know? He tells the police that child is over with him and Joseph, that he is single again and back on the prowl. He thought it was perfect and he don't know how. That whatever information they needed from him, he'd be more than willing to give. He'd be fully cooperative throughout the investigation. And he just cannot believe that Joseph has had a body in the basement. And furthermore, that he came down to the police station girl and tried to blame him for it. Now he then goes on to tell investigators that Joseph had threatened his life in the past and very recently he had become extremely violent. For the past couple of months, he has been afraid to leave him. And basically the two of them are telling investigators the same story. They're both basically in their own interrogation rooms, painting the other out to be this crazed maniac who they are deathly afraid of. Now, once they remove the body from the home, they go back and speak with Joseph and let him know that he was right, that there was a body in the home and they have now removed it. And now they, of course, need a detailed account of what had happened and who this guy is. His story remains the same, that they invited him over for a good time. At the time of the attack, all three of them are, are, are naked, okay? But Jeffrey randomly approaches the bed, pulls out a knife and stabs the guy, completely unprovoked. Then from somewhere he retrieves a revolver and shoots him as well. All the while he himself is standing there watching everything unfold completely, completely shocked. For some reason, investigators are not quite buying Joseph's story. They don't really believe him. And another interesting tidbit of information that Joseph volunteered was the fact that Jamie was supposed to turn himself in the following day on a drug charge. And so they knew that no one would be looking for him. No one would question where he is because most would assume that he was in jail serving his time. The autopsy comes back and it corroborates Joseph's story, his claims of what had happened that night. And not only are they able to confirm that, but in order to make him fit inside of this tub, they broke his legs to fold him up and get him in there. He also suffered six stab wounds and a gunshot wound. And although they have not yet caught Joseph in a lie, something feels very, very off about his story and how he's telling it. Like they just don't trust him 100%. And unfortunately for them, his story is the only story that they are getting because Jeffrey is still next door claiming not to know a thing. And since they cannot get him to admit that he is aware of what had happened that night, they have him take a lie detector test. Now they ask him to take it. They can't force him at this point, but he is more than willing. He complies 100%. He's like, I have nothing to hide. Plug me up. Let's go. The test begins and he has the same exact story at first. Then all of a sudden, midway through the questioning, he randomly just says, okay, yes, I know something about the murder. Now, investigators are, of course, watching through, you know, that double-sided glass, and they hear this, and they're like, girl, why would you lie? Like, just come on out of there and tell us what you know. He gets slightly dramatic. He's like, do you want the real deal? Do you want the real story? And they're like, baby, that's what we're here for. Like, that's what we've been, that's what we've been asking for this whole time. And he tells them, I know all about the murder. I was there that night. We figured, baby. We figured that that was the case. Now, according to Jeffrey's version of events, Joseph had invited a guy over whom he did not know at all. He didn't know his name, his identity, any of that. Only that this guy was a dealer. Now, he conveniently leaves out the portion of the story where they got to, you know, partying and tugging on each other's meats. But aside from that, his story mimics Joseph's when it comes to the attack that it seemingly happened out of nowhere, but it was Joseph who pulled out a knife, not him. And he was the one standing there paralyzed in fear, watching it all unfold, just in complete shock. 
Then, of course, it is Joseph who wraps up Jamie, takes him down into the basement, forces him to help, threatens his life. And he, of course, cooperates out of fear. Now, at this point, it is completely bizarre that they are telling the exact same story. All of the evidence that they have so far supports this story, but each of them are placing the blame on the other. So now they just need to get one of them to crack and admit that they too had a hand in the murder. Just one of the two. Now, so far, it is their belief that the two of them were in on this together, that they had invited Jamie to the house. They planned on robbing him and each one of them having their own weapon attacked him. But neither of them will admit to having anything to do with it. It's very much given the Spider-Man meme where they just pointing a finger at each other. After hours of interrogation and neither of them cracking, both of them are just placed in handcuffs, girl. They arrest both of them officially until they can do some further investigation and try to get to the bottom of this. Now, in the meantime, they contact Jamie's mother and delivers the devastating news to her. And it's very unfortunate because her and her son were very close. She'd raised him in a small town in the eastern part of Kentucky, but Jamie had always had a larger than life flair to him. Him. Even from a very young age, he showed a lot of personality, a lot of interest in his, his appearance, specifically his hair. It was a dream of his to be a stylist, a professional stylist, and someday own a salon of his own. So when he becomes of age, he decides to relocate to a larger city that better suits his aspirations and his personality. In Lexington, he enters the drag scene and begins doing shows, which he reportedly was very good at. But but unfortunately, this is not the only thing that he is introduced to. He also begins experimenting with crystal meth. And eventually, to help fund his lifestyle, he begins selling it as well. Jamie had met Joseph on September 30th in 2009 in an online chat room. The three of them, the three, frequently meet up to get high together and have group relations. So, of course, on this this particular night, Jamie has no reservations or reason to suspect that anything will go wrong or differently than any other night. Now, to be clear, Jamie lived in Lexington and these two lived in Louisville. He would link up with them only when he was in town. So outside of these little soirees, they really didn't have much contact. Both Jeffrey and Joseph are charged with the same charges murder, tampering with evidence, burglary, and a couple of smaller charges after that. And prosecutors decide to take the one to court that they felt they had the strongest case against. They'd go with that one first because they figured it'd be easier that way. Looking at the two guys' past, Jeffrey had a no prior run-ins with the law. He had never been arrested for anything. Squeaky Clean Record has a great job as a computer engineer. He's making great money, doing very well for himself, very successful. And they felt like it might be easy for the jury to look at him and believe that he was this unwilling participant in all of the things which they did not believe to be true. Now Joseph, however, was a completely different case. Now, although he had come from a pretty decent family, his father being a very renowned plastic surgeon, his family being very, very respected in the good little community that he had grown up in, he was just a very privileged kid with endless opportunities and resources. Child opportunities and resources that his family had expected him to grow up and take advantage of and unfortunately in their eyes that is not what he was doing he was not interested in becoming a surgeon himself he didn't want to be a doctor child dentist he did not want to have a corporate job he didn't want to put on a suit girl none of the things he wanted to be on the gay scene with his people and so that's mainly where he worked managing gay clubs from here and there at one point he owned one or co-owned one and you know it ain't nothing wrong with that 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 was his passion it's nothing wrong with following your passion in life. I say that and I'm talking about murderers and they be passionate about that. So sometimes it is something wrong with following your passion. You know, if your passion is hurting people that don't want to be hurt. I'm going down the rabbit hole now. So yeah. Now as for his little criminal record, which was extensive, homegirl had eight felonies, a long list of theft and drug related charges. He was a very busy guy. Okay. Now Jeffrey had also grown up in Louisville in a middle class family and he he was considered a pretty good kid, a good student. He was a boy scout at one point and was pretty much an all around unproblematic person throughout his childhood and adulthood, or so it seemed. 
Now, it was not until he was introduced to Joseph that he began to experiment with drugs. And by the beginning of the trial, the image that an investigator's prosecution and defense have of these two guys is that we have Joseph here, who is the, the, the tough bad guy, the James Dean type of persona. And then you have Jeffrey here, who is like the computer nerd geek good guy, which did not make him innocent in their eyes at all. They just noticed that, you know, that's just what his appearance and his life was giving. So the prosecution decided that the obvious choice here to try first is Joseph. Joseph would be the one that they could seal the deal on without much discourse. Both guys are facing the death penalty, but in an effort to kind of seal the deal against Joseph, the prosecution slides in and offers Jeffrey the opportunity to evade the death penalty if he testifies against Joseph. Now at this point, Joseph's attorneys, they realize that they are in a terrible position, okay? Not only are they going first, they're like the guinea pig trial. They hear that Jeffrey is going to testify against Joseph. And so they decide to call upon the only other person that was present that night that the incident happened Joseph himself they're gonna put Joseph on the stand you know what I was about to put on my regular little little pair of lashes but I remember that one of y'all Alyssa sent me a package of lashes and I appreciate it so much thank you girl and so we're gonna wear some of her lashes today from her company which you can find the link to in the description box and I wanted to do like a blue eyeliner to this, but I was too lazy to get up and go get a blue eyeshadow. And so I think these will be perfect. It has like the little piece of blue and uh, it's spelled like my son's name. Girl, was that on purpose, girl? Did you just package it like this for me? I wanna know, that's real cute. I think these would be perfect to give like that little pop of color that I feel like I'm missing from this look. Back to the story. Now Joseph's attorneys, they know that things are looking pretty bad for their client. They are not expecting to get a non-guilty verdict and their aim is not to convince the jury that he is completely innocent. Their aim is to convince the jury that he did not act alone. And so they spend most of their trial painting Jeffrey out to be this super jealous, crazed lover who actually masterminded this whole thing and acted out of jealousy. But Jeffrey takes the stand and says that they've been having these group sessions periodically for weeks and there was no kind of jealousy or discourse between any of them. Now this is something that also makes Joseph look bad because if you remember, he originally stated that he didn't even know the guy. Like he invited this dealer over, I don't even know his name, but y'all have been hooking up for weeks. And then he goes into detail one more time about the events that had transpired that he and Jamie were in the bed when Joseph just went off the rails and lost it. He alleges that Joseph looked him right in the eyes and pointed the gun at him and said, you're gonna help me or you're gonna die right here, right now. And the whole time he is going over the events of what happened that night, he is looking Joseph right in the eyes, like not even breaking his gaze, staring him down while he speaks. He also states that over the following six months, Joseph would continuously threaten to kill his family and his beloved cats that he loved so very much. He was a cat dad. So if he decided to either go to the police or try to break up with him and leave, it would be consequences and repercussions. And in the event that he did not get to carry out said consequences and repercussions before he is arrested, he had friends who would be more than willing to act on his behalf and get it done. Now the defense attorneys approach Jeffrey and ask him, who purchased the Rubbermaid container that served as Jamie's grave? And he says, Joseph, Joseph purchased it. They ask him if he's sure about that. And he's like, why, of course. This was his whole, you know, his whole doing, his whole thing. He purchased the Rubbermaid container. And as soon as he confirms that, they ask him to read aloud the transcript from his initial police interview, where they had asked him who purchased the Rubbermaid container. And he had said to them, I did, of course, I'm the one with the money. Another discrepancy that they were able to catch him up in and point out while he was sitting there on the stand is the fact that during his testimony in court, he claimed that he was forced to clean up the crime scene himself and his initial police interview he said that Joseph cleaned up the crime scene and that he had just helped to bury Jamie so when they point out these discrepancies to him he states that he just can't recall child he has a, a foggy little memory in fact he doesn't know anybody who has a hundred percent ability to recall everything all of the time but at this point, y'all, the damage was done. They had already planted the seed in the jury's mind that Jeffrey is a little liar. They then go on to 
further demonize him and tear down his little character girl by posting up his profiles, his dating profiles for the courts to see. Now in his dating profiles, he lists a lot of kinks that are mostly centered around like violence and sadomasochism. And of course the goal for that is to try to pay him out to be this, this person who gets off on violence. Like he's definitely probably a murderer, right? Now seeing how badly Jeffrey being up on the stand has seemingly begun to backfire on him. Joseph's attorneys decide last minute not to even put their guy on the stand. They like, girl, if the witness got up here and did this much damage to himself, we can only imagine how, how damaging you'd be to your own case as well. Furthermore, his lengthy little criminal history had not been discussed or brought up and they felt like putting him on the stand would risk that coming to light so they of course didn't want to do that either. Instead they call on other witnesses one of which being a contractor who takes the stand and testifies that he had been contacted in May just a month prior to their arrest by Jeffrey who wanted him to come to his home and cement the basement floor. And Jeffrey wanted this done as soon as possible. Joseph's attorney decided to close their argument just reminding the jury of all the lies that Jeffrey had been caught in during his testimony to let them know like, don't trust, don't trust Jeffrey, he's a liar. And to further drive home the idea that Jeffrey is just not one to be trusted. He sat there in his nice little suit, perfectly combed over hair, given very much Mr. Innocent, clean cut, never jaywalked a day in my life. That too, they claim, is a complete lie. They post images of him doing meth, his little hair all wild and not combed. They showed images of him in his rubber suits, looking like a little dominatrix ready to inflict some pain for his own personal pleasure. And it's no, no shade to the people that's that's into that out there because this really ain't got nothing to do with y'all. This was just courtroom propaganda. They had an agenda to push here, so they just tried to use that. Now, the prosecution who had used Jeffrey as a witness to their advantage, they basically get up there and throw little Jeffrey under the bus too. They like, you know what? Yeah, everything they say about Jeffrey is probably true, but let's not forget that Joseph is the one also. Joseph is also guilty. Let's not forget. Let's not let Joseph off, which I thought was wild, but very much deserved. Child Jeffrey had agreed to get up there and testify and help them out. I was also helping him out, of course, but he just got wore out from both from both sides in the end. He didn't deserve better, but I just still feel like that's, that's wild. The jury deliberates for 10 and a half hours before they return with a verdict for Joseph Bannis, guilty on all charges. Unfortunately, he is now facing the death penalty. So his attorneys go to the prosecution and ask for a deal of their own to evade the death penalty. If they take the death penalty off the table, he will get up there and testify in Jeffrey's trial, which is coming up in two months. They agree he is sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after I believe 30 years. Don't quote me on the 30, but he is eligible for parole eventually. And then, Two months later, Jeffrey's trial begins. Shit show number two. And according to his attorneys, his defense team, he is merely another victim of Joseph's. And for the six months in between the incident and the night they were arrested, he has lived in constant fear and has been basically a hostage of Joseph's. They claim that on that night that he called police, he had actually told Joseph that he was tired of this, that it was time for him to go to the police and let them know that Joseph had done this, that he was no longer keeping Joseph's secret. And Joseph was like, girl, I'll kill you first. They are, of course, still tearing down Joseph's character and building him up as this huge villain, this terrible guy who acted alone and just terrorized their client for months. And then something completely unexpected happens. The day comes for Joseph to take the stand and testify against Jeffrey but when asked by the judge just for clarification purposes I guess if he is here today to testify against Jeffrey he says no your honor he tells him that he he does not wish to testify against his ex-lover and they just politely escort him out of the courtroom. The prosecution is thrown for a loop. The defense team is thrown for a loop. No one suspected this. No one understood it. Like, it was just a complete curveball. Child, the girls gasped all across the courtroom. And the prosecution was left just 
clutching her pearls and scrambling for her next move because girl what was that now they escort him out of the courtroom back to his little cell and try their best to to move on with their case this of course is seen as a huge win for the defense team but they also have a little trick up their sleeve that they felt would also be a huge win for them it is a video of Joseph reading what appears to be his his I'm about to check out letter in which he not only shows that he is armed but he also admits that in the video he is holding Jeffrey hostage he turns the camera around pans it over to Jeffrey who was laying across the bed looking like that Kim Kardashian meme like he looks he doesn't I don't know it wasn't really given hostage like if I didn't hear the audio I wouldn't even know that was what was going on I would have thought he was showing him and they were on a vacation he's just literally laying in the bed but the most damning part of this video is Joseph admitting that he has done some very terrible things and one of those terrible things includes killing someone he never claims that they did it together he said that i've done some terrible things that include killing someone the whole video was definitely giving unhinged it was giving cringy i got secondhand embarrassment and i had nothing to do with these people or any of the things but yeah it was a weird weird little video now this sounds like a pretty damning piece of evidence for the defense however somebody didn't really do their job if you ask me because maybe editing the video or chopping it down is against the law maybe they didn't continue to watch the video in its entirety i don't know but as they played the video in its entirety you see footage of jeffrey not only writing the statement that joseph was reading but also rehearsing the lines with him it was very obvious that this was not just some genuine i'm about to check myself out letter or moment at all that the two of them worked together for whatever reason on this video what was the reason I don't know, but it was not what his team was trying to make it out to be here in the courtroom. Try the sun has come up behind me and it's definitely thrown off my lighting, but we're going to keep going with it, girl. We're just going to act like, you know, that's not what's going on, that everything still looks the same. This was a very messy trial and child, the mess did not stop there because five days after the trial began, Joseph has now changed his mind all of a sudden. He now wants to testify against Jeffrey. He's like, you know what? On third thought, I do want to testify against Jeffrey. Let me back in the courtroom, baby. I have something to say. Rare Beauty has launched some lip liners and lipsticks. I have them all. And baby, when I say I am in love, it's all I've been wearing. Like, I'm in love. I'm in love. And I'm loving these lashes. Like, that little pop of blue girl is just everything to me. According to Joseph, a month after he had met Jamie on the chat line is when he had met his now ex-boyfriend, Jeffrey, who appeared to be this, this basic vanilla guy. Very clean cut and innocent looking just as he had presented himself in court. And this is also the impression that he had gotten from Jeffrey while they spoke over the phone. Then Jeffrey invited him over to his house. And when he showed up there, he was taken aback, afraid even because he said that Jeffrey opened the door in this full like leather suit. I'm sorry, latex suit. And he just looked slightly unhinged very much given like a sexy edward scissorhands type of vibe but not so sexy because joseph did not find that sexy he found it to be a little unnerving so unnerving that he had reservations about entering the house at that point he wanted to be like you know what never mind take a couple steps back we're getting his car and drive off this was a completely different guy than he had he had signed up for however against this better judgment he decides to go in and you know see it might be a good time you never know right a relationship develops between the two of them but he also states that he learned very early on that jeffrey lived a dual existence on the exterior he presents himself as this innocent very nice and kind individual but who he really is as little core girl is a sadistic manipulative and violent man who cannot be trusted. And while he is talking, he is doing the exact same thing that Jeffrey had done in his trial. He is staring Jeffrey right in the eyes and not breaking his gaze as he tells 
the courts, his experience with Jeffrey over these months that they had dated, and of course what had taken place on that fateful night. The staring during the testimony definitely came off as odd in both trials. No one in the courtroom really knew what to make of it. Like, does the gaze indicate that there are some feelings there or are you staring him down like, oh yeah, I'm about to put your ass away with this? Like, which one is it? I think it's the latter. Joseph gives a lot of context to their relationship dynamic, which consisted of a lot of abuse and admittedly on both sides. He said sometimes it would be him going upside Jeffrey's head. Sometimes it'll be Jeffrey going upside his head. Like it was very even. As for the night of the initial arrest, Joseph claims that this was an elaborate plot and scheme by Jeffrey, that there was no fight that had happened that night. In fact, he didn't even know that Jeffrey had called the police until the police showed up. He was asleep before they got there. He believes that Jeffrey was at the point where he was ready for all of this to be over, but he needed Joseph to be the fall guy. So he faked this whole fight. He called 911. They asked him about the noises that could be heard, like the beating on the door, because remember he said that his lover was trying to break into the room. Joseph claimed that he was making the noises himself, that Jeffrey may have had a hammer or anything. It was a very valid question. Could the noise not be made by the person on the phone, even from the inside of the room themselves, like hitting the door? Like, how would you know? It was somebody on the outside banging on the door instead of the person themselves. You couldn't tell that over the phone. He had them there because that's true. It does not mean he's telling the truth, but I'm just saying. Jeffrey had committed this murder himself and had every intention on framing him and letting him go down for it. It's Joseph's claim. Now, from my own perspective, just my little opinion, girl ain't worth two dead flies smashed. Joseph sounded a lot more believable than Jeffrey. Even though Joseph has like this, this bad boy exterior and he definitely got some demons, girl. He sounded like he was telling the truth to an extent, like more of the truth than Jeffrey to me. The trial footage is a lot of it online. You can check it out and make that, that judgment call for yourself. But that's just my own perspective. I found what he said to be about Jeffrey, how he presents himself one way, but he is completely a different way I think that's true because when you hear Jeffrey speak like you can kind of see the villain the Disney villain is definitely there peeking her little head out but he does look like this clean gut guy I don't trust it and I don't believe it girl and like I said Joseph is no angel and he definitely appears to be the bad boy he might have a, a good piece of a good chunk of villain in him too but it's kind of like a more honest version of a villain it's like girl you see it I don't hide it Jeffrey definitely gave a sinister vibe, if you ask me, more so than Joseph. After eight long hours of deliberation, the jury returns with their verdict for Jeffrey, which is not guilty on the murder charges. He is found guilty of tampering with evidence and also a burglary charge. For the evidence tampering, he gets five years and for the burglary charge, he gets an additional three to be served consecutively. And so he serves out his little time and has since been released. However, Joseph is still serving out his sentence and he is eligible for parole in 2030, which is just eight years from now. I don't care what nobody say. Jeffrey got away with murder. He did. Now, I think they both did it together. I think they were equally responsible. And I don't know their signs, but one of them, I think Jeff, Jeffrey is definitely giving me an Aries or a Scorpio T. And that's no shade because you know I'm a Scorpio. But I, I know what the male Scorpios give and they're a little different than the females. If I had to guess for Joseph, I don't know. He could be a Sagittarius or a Capricorn. So I looked for their birthdays to see what their signs are and... I could not find it anywhere. By the time I edit this video, I will put it in the pinned comments if I'm able to find it. And I could, of course, be very wrong. However, Jeffrey really got away with murder. Like, Jeffrey got sentenced those eight years total, but he only served one. He was released after just serving one year. That's crazy. Anywho, let me know your thoughts down below. Cannot wait to read it. Can't wait to talk to y'all in the comments. As always, I appreciate you so much for spending your time with me. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace. I definitely forgot to say like, subscribe if you have not grown share the video, but y'all know to do that anyway. At least I hope so. Later. Child, the dating pool definitely has a log in it, girl. Several logs. Did I recently stick my toe in there? Possibly. Did I possibly get nicked by one of those logs? Maybe. Child, I have not had hot coffee since they put the 
Texas thermostat on hell. Hopefully I can get through filming this video without my dogs trying to rip each other's legs off in the background like they were just doing. It would be great if Bella had not gotten herself expelled from daycare. How are you guys? I hope y'all have been doing good in the presence of my absence. Is that how you say it? The presence of my absence? I think I'm thinking of the presence of my enemies. That is not right. In the presence of my... Y'all been here and I've been absent, so it makes sense. So I take the multivitamin. Multivitamin. I've been trying to learn Spanish, girl. It throws me off sometimes with my B's and my B sounds. This is the case of Joseph Bannis. Jeffrey, don't know his last name, girl. That's no bueno. Told y'all I was trying to learn Spanish. Grabbing no bueno since the third grade. I'm up to like, last time I counted, it's about 13 words. I know I know at least 17. Honey, I haven't filmed in so long. I had my fan on, humidifier, just all of the things, girl, that buzz and blows. And so hopefully the audio is not giving Britney circa 2000 and 2021. I don't wanna wait for, <clears throat> for our lives to be over. Cause then it's gonna be too late, bro. But I'm being on to him, James. There's too many J's in this story, child. Oh, Lordy. Really, Bella? He then proceeds to tell. What's the matter, mommy cat? Hey, mommy. I see you. Hey, mommy cat. It does not take much digging or much time before they unearth a tube. Not a tube. A tube, girl? No. Both Jeremy. What did I say? Jeremy? No. No. Blue is snoring in the background. I hope y'all can't hear it. But if y'all can't, girl, I'm so sorry about it. That blue is really... It's really doing it for me. Like, it really is. I'm gonna be blinking like this all day. Be looking at all the girls like this. Now, somebody gonna think I'm flirting. Now, Joseph's trial begins, and no, not Joseph. We just had Joseph's trial, girl. Is it Joseph's trial that's beginning again? What's going on, Miss Thing? But against his better judgment, he decided to enter the house and go forward with the night with Jeremy. Not Jeremy. What the? Is a sadistic manipulative girl. I can't even say it, girl. If I had to guess what, I almost got him Jonathan. <sighs> Child, my brain is just throwing out a J name at this point. Just anything to start with J. As always, I appreciate you so much for spending your. Not me touching the mic.